Good evening, everyone. I'm not so sure if you really want to be here tonight. But seeing that you are here, you might as well suffer. <laughs> I want to talk about food for thought, which is a little play upon words, because some foods affect your mind, and some affect your body. And so we want to just have a, a brief overview and then look at some foods that really do affect your mind. And uh, why is it important? Because we need to have clear minds if we want to discern between right and wrong, good and evil, and all of these issues that are associated with this. And we live on a planet that's not exactly perfect, as you know. After yesterday's lecture, it's not good, very good anymore. It's pretty bad in some places, but you know, you can't jump off the planet. You, you're stuck here, so you might as well breathe the air. And there are some risk factors that you have to deal with, but if the air is polluted, you can't say, well, the air is bad today, I'm not going to breathe today, I'll wait till it gets better tomorrow. You won't survive. So there are certain things that you have to take into account. Let me move this side. Oh, I can even look down here. This is marvelous. Okay. So if we look at the, the things that have caused disease in the world, and what are the ten leading sicknesses in the world, then we see that, well, cardiovascular disease accounts for the greatest number of calamities in the United States. And the United States is always a good example because everything they do is wrong. So <laughs> we, can, we can use them to explain what not to do. The second biggest cause of death is cancer. And then you have all the other things like lung diseases and accidents and AIDS and suicide and liver cirrhosis and kidney failure. But then you have this funny one down here, which is called other. Can you see that other is the third biggest killer in the world? So I would like to know what other is. So the first one is cardiovascular disease, the second one is cancer, and the third one is other. Now, what does science say are the underlying causes for these diseases? Well, the number one cause for most diseases on the planet are poor diet and inadequate exercise. So that's something you can do something about. The second highest cause is tobacco. Now, all the millions of smokers in the world surely can't be wrong, right? Well, they can be, and they're proving it. And then you have alcohol and infectious diseases. It might vary. If you go to Africa, for example, infectious diseases will be high. And uh, poor diet and inadequate exercise will be lower. But this is the United States. So we're looking at the United States. And then you have all the other issues. So the first three, at least, you can do something about. You can change your diet. You can stop smoking. And you can stop drinking. It's something you can do. And then you have eliminated the three biggest causes of disease. So they tell you what to do. You're not supposed to smoke. You're supposed to get enough sleep. You're supposed to eat breakfast. You know, people don't have time for breakfast. It's called break fast for a reason. Because you've had a long time where you haven't eaten, and now you break fast. In the morning, your metabolism is the highest. So that's when you want to take in nutrients and utilize them for whatever you're going to do. If you do nothing else but take breakfast, using the same quantity of food and eating it, let's say, not at breakfast, later, you will, be, have, a, you will have a tendency to become overweight. Whereas if you eat the same quantity of food but you have a large portion of it for breakfast, you have the opposite tendency. So it's a very good idea to start getting used to breakfast. No eating between meals. This is something that is uh, an American plague. 
because even if they don't eat, they chew gum, which simulates eating. And the problem is that your glands in your stomach and uh, the salivary secretions that you produce have enzymes and they store these and the, the acid producing cells store the acids and they want to release it when you eat. And it's a, it's a pretty all or nothing response. Once you put something into your mouth and into your stomach, whether you're eating a meal or whether you're eating a morsel, you're going to release those enzymes. And then you need to recuperate. You need to, you're not a cow. You're a human being. A cow has a pre-stomach where things ferment and it can chew and carry on all day, but you can't. Even a lion knows to eat only once a week. Maintain proper weight, exercise regular, and moderate or no use of alcohol. That's what the world says what you're supposed to do. Now here's an interesting article that appeared in some of the scientific journals. How many patients are killed by their cures? And uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association was the first one to come up with some figures. And it seems as if prescribed medication is the number three killer in the world. Many, many people die from the prescribed cures. And you can just look at the celebrities in the world and see what they died from. Most of them die either from drug overdoses or from prescribed medication. Michael Jackson just comes to mind as I think about it. So this is a serious issue. You really want to get rid of this stuff. And what can you do to prevent getting sick so that you don't have to take all this medication? Well, one of the problems we have in our society today is the pollution and the contamination and all the free radicals, that, uh, all the charged particles in your body that rob you of your vitality. You need to mop them up. You're not going to get rid of them. And the fried foods and the things that we see in the world that produce free radicals, you have to solve this problem. So people always want to have a tablet. Don't change my lifestyle. It's too complicated. Give me a tablet. That's what they want. They'll pop a vitamin pill, or they want this, or they want that, or something of that nature. Why can't you give it to me all in one dose, and then I don't have to worry about it? And this was a, a vogue a couple of years ago, and this is quite old data, uh, but it's relevant to what actually happened. Well, people knew that if you eat a lot of yellow foods, then you have protection against many diseases. And what is yellow in the food? Well, it's the beta carotene, so the beta carotene must be good for you, right? And so what they did is they thought, well, what if we extract the beta carotene, put it in a tablet, and you take it every day, then you don't have to eat all that bulky yellow food and all that fruit and all that stuff, and you'll be much better off. It's so much simpler. Just give me a tablet. So that's what they did. Vitamin pill fails to fend off cancer. Taking a supplement of beta carotene is not equivalent to eating a diet that is rich in fruit and vegetables. And then they started finding some serious, serious problems. And uh, they wanted to put the label on the bottles which says, anti-carcinogenic, beta carotene, take this tablet. Fortunately, there are still laws where they tell you that you're not supposed to do that unless you have proof. So the, the organizations and the countries that control these issues said, no, 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 you have to do a 10-year study. You have to determine that beta carotene really does protect against cancer. Then you can put it on there. But they were selling it as a supplement anyway. So there were two studies that were running the one was the Finnish study that was going for a few years already, and then the Americans started what was called the Corette study. And uh, how do you do this quickly? Well, the easiest thing is get people that are prone to cancer. Well, what category would you use then? Smokers. Excellent. Let's get smokers. 
heavy smokers. And we divide them into two groups. And the one group we give a placebo, and the other group we give beta carotene, and then we will prove over a period of time that beta carotene protects against cancer. Logical experiment. So that's what they did. And this one started off first, this Finnish study, and it was supposed to run for 10 years, but they cut it short after seven odd years. And the American one was to run for 10 years as well, and they cut it short after four years. And the reason was that they got the results that were coming out from the Finnish study, and lo and behold, the people that got beta carotene had higher cancer rates and mortalities than those that didn't get it, that got the placebo. So they got a big fright and they started analyzing the, the data in the American study. And after four years, they found exactly the same thing. Those that got beta carotene actually had more cancer than those that didn't. Oops, <laughs> big problem. So what's the problem? Because yellow foods protect against cancer. How do you solve this? Then the medical magazine started coming out, gefährliches beta carotene, dangerous beta carotene, it's going to have all kinds of effects on you and it's going to basically kill you and it's going to affect your heart and it's going to affect your cardiovascular system as a whole and it's going to give you more cancer and it's a dangerous product. So they started realizing that you cannot actually isolate something and say, this is the component in the food that will solve your problem. You can't do that. Because food is designed as a package and it comes with all kinds of chemicals in it that either suppress an action or enhance an action and something that can be negative in isolation in combination with all the other things in the food actually does exactly the opposite. So the problem cannot be solved with a tablet that readily. Now I'm not saying take no tablets, because some tablets actually do something, but uh, uh, the modern tendency is to take whole food vitamins. Instead of isolating the chemical and producing it chemically, you take the fruit and you isolate it down to the shape of a tablet and you pop that, but it's everything that was in there originally. These things are a bit more expensive, but they could work, but it's still not the perfect solution. So when you want to know what kind of stuff you find in certain foods, then you will find that uh, if you want the antioxidant vitamin E, where would you find it? You would find it in wheat germ oils and basically in all the seeds and the and the, the nuts and the almonds and the soy oils and the, all of those things. And the top antioxidant fruits would be strawberries and plums and origins and grapes, etc. And the vegetables would be garlic and kale and spinach and Brussels sprouts and all of those things. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to eat garlic every single day of your life. And especially if you're romantically inclined, it's a bit of a problem. So you can have varieties of these and probably get most of the antioxidants that you need in your body. So these are actually the best tablets on the market. Those are the ones you want to take because there you have the package deal. So these tablets look good, these tablets taste good, and these tablets take a little bit more time and a little bit more chewing than the popping ones, but they will do the trick because they have the right combinations. So if you want to know what kind of phytochemical there is in a plant, well, they've isolated them. Brussels sprouts will have one called sinigrin. It'll have others as well, but this will be the main one. Broccoli will have another one and uh, another one in some broccolis. And so you can go down the, the, the list. Citrus fruit will have limonene. And uh, fruits in general will have caffeic acid, not to be confused with caffeine. It's something totally different. And grains have phytic acid. 
Now, isn't it interesting that some of these actually get bad press? You must have heard that phytic acid is not good for you, right? Have you heard that? So you shouldn't have too many grains because phytic acid is bad for you. In fact, phytic acid is a slight enzyme suppressant. And so people think, whoa, <laughs> I don't want to eat something that suppresses my enzymes. That's not a good idea. And so if you are not fully informed as to what is actually happening, you might give some of those bad press and others might give them positive press. Now, the interesting thing is, some foods like legumes, uh, grains, will have enzyme suppressants in them. Is that a bad thing? Are we not designed to eat them? Uh, I'm, a, I'm, of course, a believer in design. I know I'm weird, but I believe that these things were designed. Now, why would there be an enzyme depressant in some of the staple foods that we eat, like wheat, for example? Why would there be an enzyme suppressant? Well, you see, if you have an enzyme suppressant in there that depresses the, the digestion just slightly, that means that by the time it gets through to the colon, not all of it is digested. And you know how happy the bacteria in your colon are about that? They can flourish because they're actually getting something to eat because there was a, an enzyme depressant. And the bacteria that you then get there will also be of the variety that keep your colon healthy. So sometimes something that looks negative at first glance actually turns out to be designed to be useful. So if we know these things, then uh, eating starts making a little bit more sense and becomes fun because uh, uh, you can actually enjoy it. If you worry too much about it, well, you, you get a nervous breakdown. Now, what are your best brain foods? Well, anything that's high in carbohydrate. Now, isn't it interesting that the world says you should cut down on carbohydrates because it's going to make you fat? No, carbohydrates don't make you fat. It's refined carbohydrates that make you fat. You're supposed to have carbohydrates. Your body wants carbohydrates. It's your fuel. It's your fuel. You can't put metal into your fuel tank when you're driving a car because most of your car is made of metal. You put fuel into your fuel tank because your engine is designed to run on fuel. In the same way, you are composed largely of proteins and substances like that, but that doesn't mean that your body wants to feed only on protein. It wants to have carbohydrate as its fuel. It wants protein for maintenance and for growth. Now, what are the foods that are rich in carbohydrates? Dates. This is nature's highest source of glucose. Now what's interesting is whenever something in nature is rich in glucose, then it's also rich in soluble fiber. Because soluble fiber actually holds on to the glucose. So that when you eat it, it doesn't go straight into your bloodstream like a refined sugar. It stays in your intestine and is released slowly. So this is a superfood. If you want to do sport, if you want to run marathons, then the best thing that you could do for yourself is to choose some dates. You will have sustainable energy like you cannot believe. If you want to have power for something like that, then you make yourself a smoothie of bananas, some soy milk, and dates. And see if you don't outperform uh, the other people. Figs, grapes, carob, bananas, currants, all of these things. Nuts, particularly almonds. Almonds are an alkaline nut. There are not many alkaline nuts in the world. Almonds, one of them. Legumes, whole grains, avocado, these are your brain foods, your energy foods that your brain craves. Legumes. 
excellent food. Remember, they have enzyme suppressants. And in the dry form, they have excess enzyme depressants because they have to keep that, that seed in a dormant state. So when you, when you utilize them, you must soak them well in lots of water. And what must you do with that water? You throw it off. You throw it away. And it's full of the compounds that are the depressants, and you throw it away. That's what happens in nature. You plant the seed. It rains. It swells. It rains again. Those compounds leach out into the ground. And then the plant can germinate because the enzymes get active. So you want to leach them out. Now, many a kind lady will think, but this looks so good. And then she makes a soup with it, right? And that causes what? Enzyme suppressing. The bacteria get way too much food down there, fermented down there in your colon. And it makes for an explosive experience. Nuts and seeds, these are brain foods. Now, garlic and substances like this, these aren't rich foods. These are condiments that you use. Uh, some people think they must make a meal out of garlic, and they chew it like an apple. Uh, these people are normally to be avoided. But... Uh, it's an excellent food, and it can also be a medicinal food. Uh, the cruciferous vegetables, very high in anti-carcinogens. So this is what kept the German nation alive. If it wasn't for the cabbage, the Germans wouldn't exist anymore. Because the rest of their diet was not that hot. And then the umbiliferous vegetables, these are the ones with the, the anti cancer foods. This is what you want in your diet. These are the tablets that your body craves, and you want variety. Now, let's talk about carbohydrates, because carbohydrates get such a bad press. Your brain occupies 2% of your body weight, but it consumes 20% of your body's oxygen and up to 50% of your body's glucose, because that's its food. It wants glucose. Now what happens if I don't feed it glucose, but I feed it protein? Like a South African diet. A, a South African diet consists of meat, and then chicken will be the vegetable. What happens if I give that diet to the human body? Well, then I get a lot of protein. An average Adult male needs about 70 grams of protein per day to sustain all his protein needs. If he's a, if he's a heavy uh, fellow who plays in the front row of the, of the sports team, well, then he might need maximum 90 grams of protein a day. The average South African will eat 360 to 400 grams of protein a day and uh, the New Zealanders as well. Uh, they compete with each other. So now your brain is saying, excuse me, I need glucose, and you're giving me protein. So what's your body going to do? It can't work with, with the amino acids, so it's going to take that, transform it into glucose. But protein contains nitrogen, it contains sulfur, it contains ring structures, phenolics, and all of those things. So you have to split them all out. And so now you're putting nitrogen load on your body, and your body says, whoa, I can't deal with this toxin. Detoxify the ammonia, so they make it into urea, which is still toxic. And then you have to get rid of that. And the sulfur is a major problem, because that gets split out as sulfate, and you have to neutralize it calcium out of the bone. That's your pathway that you're going to use. So you're, you're loading your body with a load of problems, and then you get carbohydrate finally for your brain. Short circuit it. Give it the carbohydrate as it needs it, and lower your protein content. So your brain wants carbohydrate. 
to function. And now my mouse is being ridiculous here. What's the matter with you? Ah, okay. Well, I was going to talk about mice anyway. Here are two groups of mice. It's not a very nice picture, but it tells a story. You can see that the group on the left over here looks a lot better than this moth-eaten lot on this side. And this side, you can see the tail is limp because these rats are on the point of death. They can't care anymore. They're just lying there ready to die. And these rats on the left here, they are pulling at the tail, so they're very much alive and happy. In fact, the mice on the left lived considerably longer, almost double, as long as these mice on the right. And guess what? They had exactly the same diet. Exactly the same diet. But the group on the left got as much as they needed. And the group on the right got as much as they wanted. And they lived half as long. So what does that tell you about overeating? It's a problem, right? I don't know if you remember the singer Mario Lanza. Do you remember him, some of the old people? He used to eat 12 chickens in a day. I couldn't compete with that, but I did pretty well myself. So you don't want refined foods because of the lack of soluble fiber that holds on to the glucose. It impedes your immune system, it eventually can lead to diabetes. If you feed rats a carcinogen, something that causes cancer, and you feed it complex carbohydrates, then they have lower incidence of breast cancer than if you feed them a carcinogen and simple sugars. So you don't want to have a refined food like this. This is bad news for your body. And... Uh, I'm sorry about that, but if you're going to eat this, then make sure that you have something that is whole food before you eat that, so that you can have some soluble fiber in your body to help your body to cope with this kind of food. Uh, here's the Cleveland Clinic of Wellness. It says, eating simple sugars or highly processed carbs provides a quick spike and drop in blood sugar response, which leads to low levels of brain chemicals, serotonin. A low serotonin level leads to feeling bad, crabby, and irritable. It's involved in the regulation of mood, sleep, appetite. Low levels of serotonin are linked with depression and anxiety. Now, we dealt a little bit with that yesterday already, when we dealt with some of the carnivores and why they're so crabby and so, <laughs> so miserable. So, a glucose spike is highly problematic. If you look at a normal grain, it has an outer layer of non-soluble fiber. Then there is soluble fiber in the grain, and then you have a germ in the grain. Now, modern wheat mills separate these into their three components. And that's a problem, because then you get more refined food than you should. And uh, the outer layers make for the food to go down slowly and controlled. And uh, the wheat germ is your antioxidant that you need and the vitamin Bs that you need to, to digest the, the rest of it. So if you want a healthy diet, then you should have largely, if not completely, uh, whole grain bread and whole grain foods. So if you look at the soluble fiber intake, uh, the higher your soluble fiber intake, the lower your cancer rate. The, the less you have, the higher your cancer rate. It's just one of those facts, so we have to live with it. On the left over here, you have a, a miserable looking gut with lots of diverticula. This is caused by constipation and pressure. And uh, uh, 
you have diverticular because you know you're causing the pressure and it blows up and the same thing happens to your blood vessels you know if you have to sit in the little room and you go bright red in the process then you have a problem uh, it should not happen that way you should go to the little room and you should have what they call a UR experience it should be done and over with because if you have uh, to apply pressure, it means you don't have enough uh, fiber in your diet. It'll cause the blood to go down into your legs and it'll cause the blood to go up into your head. And uh, eventually it causes instability in the blood vessels, leads to all kinds of problems, varicose veins, all of these things. This is what a gut must look like. It must be nice and compact, no diverticular. Here's a response to glucose meals. So this spike over here is the glucose increase in the blood after you've taken a glucose meal, no fiber. You can see that the blood glucose level rises. You have the spike. As a consequence, your body goes into emergency mode and produces insulin in high quantities, releases it, and immediately your blood sugar levels come down and they drop down to lower than what they were before and then you're hypoglycemic. Uh, if you have fiber in the diet, same amount of sugar, the blood glucose only rises that high, your insulin also only rises that high and at the end of the uh, of the process, after three hours, your blood glucose level is where it was before. I used to make my students do this experiment. I used to get rabbits and I'd have them divide the rabbits into various groups and then we would monitor the blood glucose levels over time and we would give them the equivalent of a can of coke. So that's a few cubic centimeters, few milliliters in a syringe and they love Coca-Cola. Did you know that rabbits love Coca-Cola? They're just as stupid as humanity. They love it. And then we'd give another one, we'd give fruit juice, and another one we'd give uh, glucose with fiber, pectin in, dissolved in it, and we'd monitor it. And within a very short time, all the rabbits that were on Coca-Cola were hypoglycemic. They were totally brain dead. And I used to forbid my students to drink Coca-Cola or take any refined sugar before an exam. Because if they come and tell me they drew a blank, it's not my problem. It's their diet that did it. So you don't want a glucose spike. It's uh, rather uh, distressing. Here are the symptoms. You have autonomic activation and neuroglycopenic symptoms. So sweating, shaking, warmness, heart palpitations, anxiety, shivering, just from the sugar. And then you have these uh, that affect the brain, confusion, drowsiness, weakness, difficulty speaking, slurred speech, visual disturbances, dizziness. And uh, this is typically what you find in students that are writing exams. And here's an article which tells you that uh, kurzfristiger Anstieg von Glucose, Glucose besonders gefährlich. Not only does this short rise in glucose affect your thinking patterns, it also affects your blood vessels directly. And your blood vessels will want to protect themselves. And you know what they do? They release fat, triglycerides. So when you actually get a glucose spike, you also get a triglyceride spike. In other words, the fat in your blood starts rising. Now, when you get fat in your blood, it actually coats your red blood corpuscles. And it reduces the, the oxygen exchange across the barriers. And very often, the fat also makes them clump together. So if you have a red blood corpuscle, and you have another one, and there's a fat layer which clumps them together, you are reducing four surfaces to two surfaces. So what does that do to your oxygen supply to your brain? 
cuts it by half. Cuts it by half. It's not a good idea if you're writing exams to have your oxygen in your blood cut by half. I'll show you some other things that do that as well. So these are the things you have to watch out for if you want to have a happy brain. Here is the American Nutrition Association, and uh, here's the scientist, and he's talking about excitotoxins, uh, the taste that kills, in which he explains that certain amino acids, when overly abundant in the brain, can cause neurons to die. Many biochemicals can act as neurotransmitters in the brain. Some excite our neurons, others calm them. In particular, glutamate, aspartate, and cysteine. Those are normal amino acids. Are three amino acids that excite our neurons and, called, and are called excitotoxins. And they are now added in large amounts to our food supply. Now, this was one of the issues that caused so much consternation when it came to what amino acids actually do. Here's a partial list of the most common names, how they disguise monosodium glutamate. For example, uh, they can call it monosodium glutamate. They can call it hydrolyzed vegetable protein, hydrolyzed protein, hydrolyzed plant protein, plant protein extract, sodium cassinate, calcium cassinate, yeast extract, textured protein, autolyzed yeast, hydrolyzed oat flour, or any one of those. If you read any of those on the label, then you should avoid it. And now there's a new trick where they say no added MSG. That's rather clever. No added MSG. They put it big on there because no people are taking care and looking at what they're reading. When they've actually, when you read it, it'll have, let's say, yeast extract. Then it'll have it there already. Uh, here's uh, one that's particularly problematic, that's aspartame, and you will find it in many, many food sources as a sweetener, even in medications, and it's also called NutraSweet or Equal or spoonful, spoonful or Equal Measure, and it's responsible for about 75% of adverse reactions. It can cause headaches, dizziness, seizures, nausea, numbness, muscle spasm, depression, fatigue, irritability, tachycardia, racing heart, insomnia, vision problems, hearing loss, all kinds of things. Anxiety attacks, slurred speech, tinnitus. Why would you want to put something like that into your food? And why is it a problem? We need to understand why it is a problem. How does it actually work? Well, it's been associated, in some, in some states in the states, it's actually forbidden. And in the next state, it's not forbidden. So you can actually compare uh, the disease rates in the various states from where it is forbidden and where it is not forbidden. It's been associated with brain tumors, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, chronic fatigue syndrome. It, uh, it increases the, the effect on Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, and all kinds of funny things like that. Now, what does it consist of? It consists of aspartic acid, phenylalanine, and methanol, which is, a, which is an alcohol. Aspartic acid is just an amino acid. But when you take it in its free form, unbound, it raises the blood plasma levels of aspartate and glutamate. And these are excitotoxins. All right, let me explain this to you. These substances are sweet. Not because they are sweet, but because they fool you that they are sweet. Your sugar receptors on your tongue react when you have sugar on your tongue. And they send a stimulus to your brain, and that says to your brain, sugar on the way. And then immediately your brain sends a stimulus to your pancreas and says, listen, get ready, sugar's on the way. I want you to produce some insulin. Now, when you take a free amino acid, it actually stimulates that receptor, even though there's no sugar. 
And it tells your brain there's something sweet. So what is your brain going to tell your pancreas? Make insulin. Make insulin and do it right now. But then you're not getting sugar. You're getting an amino acid. And like anybody who cries wolf, wolf long enough, eventually your pancreas starts to ignore your brain. And then you happen to eat something that's really sweet and then you're in trouble. So it exacerbates things like insulin uh, problems and diabetic problems. It's, it's a problem. Now, it's an excitotoxin. But you will tell me, but good grief, if I eat proteins, I get the same thing. Of course you get the same thing. Now, this is why I believe in design. I believe God created it in such a way and that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. It's just my conviction. Because I, I cannot fail to see the brilliance of it. There is no food in nature that gives you a free amino acid. Everything is bound in proteins. All the amino acids are always in a protein. When I eat that protein, it gets into my stomach, and there's an enzyme called pepsin, and that splits it into polypeptides, big chunks of amino acids bound in a polypeptide. No free amino acid. Then it goes into my duodenum, and I add another enzyme, which is called trypsin, and that breaks it into smaller polypeptides. And then it goes down my intestine, and lower down, I add from cells down there other enzymes, which are called exopeptidases, and they start cutting off the free amino acids. So where in a normal diet in my intestine do I get free amino acids? Down there. Down there. Never up here. Down there. Now down here, the whole system of my intestine is drained by the hepatoportal system. Those blood vessels go up and they go through to the liver. So the free amino acids that I've produced in my digestive process first go to the liver. Then the liver packs them in twos and threes, dipeptides and tripeptides, and puts them into your blood as an amino acid source. So in my normal diet, what does my systemic blood system get from the digestion? Dipeptides, tripeptides. Now some of these, let's say I have aspartate or glutamate as an amino acid, packed like that, it'll have no effect. It'll go across the blood-brain barrier and it'll go into my brain and do nothing there. It'll enter the neurons and the cells, and it'll do nothing. And then, when the brain wants to send an impulse, there's an enzyme which splits it off, and it has a reaction. And the next neuron is fired. And that's how it works. But now, I take it in a free form, already as an amino acid. And it tells my tongue, sweet! Are you with me? Sweet. And it goes into my stomach, but it's already digested. It's an already an amino acid. It's absorbed right there in the stomach, just like we absorb water and other ish things in the, in the stomach already, and here early in the intestine, which is not drained totally by the hepatoportal system. It goes straight into my blood. Now I'm getting a free amino acid going into my brain. What are my neurons going to do? That's what they're going to do. That's what they're going to do. So it's an excitotoxin. So now you're feeding this stuff to your kids. You're giving them a cool drink and it has aspartame in it. Or you're giving them a yogurt and it has aspartame in it. You're trying to give him something healthy and you didn't read the label. So now he sits in class and instead of listening carefully to what the teacher is saying, because his neurons are going crazy. And this is what this stuff does. So your brain gets short-circuited. 
Excessive levels of phenylalanine in the brain can cause the levels of serotonin in the brain to decrease. So now you're getting these amino acids freely into your brain and all of a sudden you are not only fidgety, you're now also crabby. And we are wondering why we are seeing so much violence in the world and we are seeing so much violence in the schools because people are overstimulated and irritable because their brain has been shot. Now, the other component is methanol. The recommended limit is 7.8 milligrams per day. And a one liter aspartame sweetened beverage contains 56 milligrams of methanol. Good grief. And what does that do? And heavy users containing products, they can get, might just get as much as 250 milligrams per day, or 32 times the recommended dose. That's pretty bad news. When I was uh, working in, uh, in the university, we had a cleaner who was cleaning the, the equipment, and uh, he saw the bottles of ethanol and propanol and methanol on the rack, and he thought, well, alcohol is alcohol, so he took the methanol and he had uh, a heavy swig. And he ended up in hospital, and he was uh, blinded for a, for a couple of days. And after that, he suffered from ataxia. He didn't know where to put a glass down. He would put it down and he would think it's on the table when it's still there, and he would break everything. So he couldn't be used in his job anymore. So it's not a good idea. So aspartame, you will find it in, in breakfast foods, breath mints, cereals, sugar-free chewing gum, cocoa mixes. You'll find it in juices, in laxatives, in supplements, in soft drinks, everywhere. So just look out for it. I'll leave that one out. All right, we looked at the, the, the killers in the world. We saw poor diet was number one. We saw smoking was number two. Alcohol was number three. We spoke about some of those already. I just want to say a few things about nicotine, just for interest's sake. I had a colleague who was an A-grade scientist whose sole research was nicotine. He did wonderful work. Uh, I loved his work. Uh, here's a lung that's a city lung. It's a little bit uh, blackened, but it looks quite good. This is a heavy smoker lung, not, not a good idea. But what this colleague of mine did, he worked with nicotine, and he studied the effect on rats. And uh, you, you can't get a rat to smoke, so he used to inject the, the nicotine to see what the effect was. But he took pregnant rats. And he would take a, the pregnant rats and he would inject nicotine, the equivalent of a regular smoker, into the mother. Never into the, the embryos, into the mother. And then he looked at the development in the pups. In other words, the mother was a smoker, what effect did it have on her children, put simply? And uh, he looked at various parameters. Now, one of the parameters he looked at in the pups after they were born. So this is the age after they were born, after 14 days, after 21 days, 35 days, 42 days. He would analyze the alveolar volume. Now, the alveoli are the little air sacs in your, in your lungs. And he would analyze that, and if, they, if the mother got nicotine, one milligram per kilogram nicotine given to the mother, which is a very low dose, by the way, then you would see that the alveoli volume in those that received nicotine was much higher, statistically highly significant, than in the controls, where the mother did not get nicotine. So the air sacs were big. You don't want big air sacs, you want small ones, because if they're small and numerous, then you have a high surface to volume ratio for the exchange of oxygen. And oxygen is important for your brain. So we're dealing with things that affect your brain as well. The alveoli number, that's the number of air sacs. If they got nicotine, 
you can see that they produced fewer air sacs in the, in the pups than when they did not get nicotine. So what does that actually look like? Well, here's a control one. There's a, a size indicator, and there's an alveoli, and you can see the size of this alveoli. So this is a lung of a control group that got no nicotine. It's a beautiful looking lung. These are the bronchi, and those are all the alveoli little sacs. They're all nice and compact, and they look good, and the epitheliums look great. And uh, this is one where they got nicotine. And you can see over there, this one is falling apart over there, and uh, they're much bigger, uh, much bigger than in the other one, and it doesn't look good at all. And then he did something else. He took the lungs and he dissolved the tissue in acid so that only the connective tissue would remain. And here is a control uh, lung where all the tissue has been dissolved, so you can't see the structure, just the elastic fibers. And look at that in the control group. It looks beautiful. So this lung was elastic, gorgeous. And that's the nicotine one. Now remember, this is the, the baby. It never smoked. The mother smoked. And look at that. Hardly any elastic tissue. Now, if I took myself and my, my wife, my wife grew up in a house where both parents were chain smokers. And I grew in, up in a house where nobody was a chain smoker. Now, I used to chain smoke but I only started smoking when I was 18 till when I was 21, and I smoked like a chimney. But my development was already complete. You know when you go to the doctor and you, you do the lung test and you blow that thing, and you see how far the indicator goes? Well, I would blow that thing into the middle of next week. My wife would go, it would go that far. You cannot believe how pathetic her lungs are. Why? because she inherited them from, your, from her parents. So here's my point. You're not only affecting yourself, you're affecting the future. And now the bad news. Do you want, to, you want me to continue, or should we just give up now? Just, you know, give you a break. <laughs> All right. What about tea, coffee, and cocoa? I mean, these things look so great. You know, the Western world didn't know these things at all. And uh, it was only in the time of the Reformation that this was actually introduced into the Western world. And it came via, believe it or not, the church. It came via the church. The whole coffee industry and the cocoa industry was started by the Jesuit order in order to, f to fund the counter-reformation. But uh, that's another history, so I won't go into that. Let's have a look at some of these beverages and what they actually mean. The largest food, uh, the largest corporations in the food industry are exactly those that deal with these issues. So you will have the Mars Incorporation, which deals with you know, all the, the Milky Way, the, the chocolates, and all of those things. Nestle, of course. Mega corporations. They deal in these foods. Why do they sell so much of these foods? Because people have a craving for them. So if you want to, want to uh, create a mega corporation that makes lots of money, then you have to do a little bit of research as to what is actually addictive and what will cause a craving so that everybody will want it. That's a good way of making money, right? Uh, PepsiCo and all of these uh, mega companies, they produce these kinds of foods. Or Unilever Group. Now, I'm not knocking them. I'm just giving you the facts. These are the largest food corporations. One of the biggest companies in the world is Coca-Cola. 
And uh, I, as I told you, I made my students do experiments with Coca-Cola. They hated me for it, but that doesn't matter. Uh, does Coca-Cola contain co cocaine? There's nothing quite like the sugary rush that accompanies a cold glass of Coca-Cola. But did you know that the aptly named Coke used to deliver an even bigger kick? Until 1903, the world-famous soft drink contained a significant dose of cocaine. So if you want to make your product addictive, well, that's a great component to put in there. Uh, while the Coca-Cola company officially denies the presence of cocaine in any of its products, past or present, historical evidence suggests that the original Coca-Cola did, in fact, contain cocaine. Uh, it wouldn't become totally cocaine-free until 1929, when scientists perfected the process of removing all psychoactive elements from the coca leaf extract. While the modern-day recipe is highly prized, it's not a secret that they have still uh, imported vast quantities of cocoa leaf, and they, they extract the cocaine, but because they've extracted the cocaine, uh, they've lost the component that is addictive. What do you think they replace it with? With caffeine. With caffeine, which is also addictive. So they still have an addictive drug. And uh, so that's rather interesting. Now, what about all these uh, chocolatey things and all these great things? Well, let me first go through a principle here. Uh, here you have a tea plantation. This is now a black tea plantation. And you can see that it's nice and flat on top, right? Now, how do they get it so nice and flat? Well, they take long sticks and they prune it this way. They hit it. And then when they've pruned it nice and flat like that, then it starts growing again and it makes new leaves and a bud. And then they harvest the leaves and the bud. Now, here is an animal. That's the earlunt. And he's a browser, and he's eating these acacia leaves. Now, as he's eating, what is he doing to the leaves? He's damaging them. He's breaking them. He's tearing them. He's not cutting them. He's going rip, 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 rip. And as a consequence, these trees start producing a pheromone. And it warns the entire tree, and not only that tree, but all the trees in the immediate vicinity. And the tree reacts to the broken leaves and starts increasing the tannins and the toxin levels in the leaf. And the eel hunt will go, and stop eating. And then he'll walk 50 meters, 100 meters, and he'll start eating again. Now, if you think like I do, which is a bit weird, then you immediately think, what a brilliant design. Because number one, it prevents overgrazing of the plant. I mean, if you have a nice, pleasant plant in front of you, why not eat the whole thing and get done with it, right? But then the tree wouldn't recuperate. So in this way, you prevent overgrazing. And the animal moves along, and the plants have a chance to recuperate. Now, when that new leaf comes out and it regenerates itself, it also takes care of itself by increasing the toxic levels in that new growth so that no self-respecting elant or other animal will target the new growth. Doesn't that sound like design to you? It's brilliant. Now, of course, if you put the animal in an enclosure and it can't eat anything else, it will eat the entire plant, whether it likes it or not, because it's hungry. But if it has a normal environment, it won't. So the eel hunt is very bright. Now, let's look at humanity. Humanity has now hit and sliced and savaged 
the top of the plant. What has it simulated? Grazing. The plant now produces new growth and protects that new growth with what? With suppressants and substances which will prevent any self-respecting normal animal to eat it. Humanity goes and picks that new growth. Can you see the light green over there? They're going to pick it now. And then they will take these two leaves and a bud which have the highest levels of toxins in them. And that's not enough. So now they've discovered that if they put this in a vat and they ferment it, then the bacteria will get rid of everything that is useful. They will use it. And what will remain? The concentrated tannins and toxins. They will remain. And then what does humanity do with that? They put it in a bag, they pop it into hot water, and they extract it. And then they try to drink it, but it's bitter, and any self-respecting animal would say, ugh, disgusting. How do you solve that problem? Well, you throw sugar in there to make this horrible drink palatable. And then it still is astringent. It's not good enough. So what do you add to make it slide? Cream. In whatever form. And then you have managed to produce the full catastrophe. And you feed it to humanity. And they become addicted to it because there are addictive substances in it. Do you think it's a clever idea? No animal is as stupid as the human being. These are the alkaloids that you will find in tea, coffee, and cocoa. Theophylline, you'll find it in tea. Theobromine, you'll find it in cocoa. Caffeine, you will find it in tea, and you will find it in coffee. Now, what do these substances do? Caffeine influences your gastrointestinal function. It affects weight loss, kidney function, cardiovascular system, your nervous systems, women's health, all of these things. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. There are many things in tea that are good for you. But if there's a high concentration of something that's bad for you, why would you want to take it? Would you drink water with five drops of arsenic in it? No, you would not. Why would you not drink a tea that has all the good components and none of the bad, like uh, rooibos tea or herb tea or any one of those, rosehip tea or you mentioned it, fruit tea. Why would you not want that? Because it doesn't have a kick, right? It doesn't have a kick. Heart disease, high blood pressure, cholesterol levels, uh, all kinds of women health problems, osteoporosis, all associated with these. Now, mental health issues, alkaloids, and caffeine, and theophylline, and theobromine, the worst one, by the way, which you find in cocoa, are psychoactive drugs. What does that mean? They act primarily on the central nervous system where they alter your brain function, resulting in temporary changes in perception, mood, consciousness, cognition, behavior. And caffeine is the world's most widely consumed psychoactive drug. Uh, it appears to have a positive invigorating effect on the mind and the body, but in reality they exhaust the system and this causes craving for more. And this way a dependency is developed. And they induce symptoms which mimic psychiatric disorders. Uh, this is getting quite interesting. So the nutritional biochemist Stephen Chinesky, author of Caffeine Blues, writes, if a person were injected with 500 milligrams of caffeine, less than the dose in some 16-ounce brews, within about an hour, he or she would exhibit symptoms of severe mental illness. Among with hallucinations, paranoia, panic, mania, depression. But the same amount of caffeine administered over the course of a day only produces the milder forms of insanity for which we take tranquilizers and antidepressants. 
the whole of humanity is ab about uh, to take uh, antidepressants and substances like that, because if you take one drug, you have to solve the problem using another drug. So then you become a total zombie. If over a decade of practice as clinical nutritionist, I have seen firsthand with thousands of clients that caffeine is a health hazard. Anxiety, muscle aches, PMS, headaches. However, if that's all caffeine has done, you're still lucky. What about people misdiagnosed as neurotic, psychotic, who spend years and small fortune on psychotherapy, all because no one asked them about their caffeine intake? All right. Manic episodes, panic disorders, generalized anxiety disorders, amphetamine intoxication, sedative, hypnotic, oh, the list is unbelievable. These are the mental disorders associated with it. Caffeine intake perpetuates many of the factors contributing to weight gain. Coffee and caffeine intake aggravates stress, including physical, mental, emotional stress, and it leads to increased levels of corticosteroids, including cortisol, so it mimics a fight and flight mechanism. Now, you know, if you have a fight and flight mechanism, that means you're gonna run like crazy or fight like crazy. But you're not gonna do that when you're sitting behind a computer drinking a cup of coffee. So your body has to start analyzing this. If you drink caffeine, and it produces the cortisone reaction. Immediately your body is telling you, you're in trouble. You're going to have to fight or you're going to have to run like crazy. There's a rhinoceros on your tail. Get out the way. And the cortisone prepares your body for inflammation or damage or injury. And it also makes you release glycogen from your liver. So you get a glycogen spurge. Glucose going into your blood, just from the caffeine. Now, what do they put in Coca-Cola? Sugar. Up to 10 to 12 teaspoons per can. That gives you a sugar rush like you cannot believe, which can have psychotic effects. At the same time, there's a high dose of caffeine in there, which gives you a sugar rush from the glycogen which is released from your liver. So you're getting a double sugar rush, just from the caffeine. So now, let's say you take the sugar out and you take a Diet Coke. What are they going to put in that? They're going to put aspartame in there, which is an excitotoxin. And once you've exhausted your mind, your mind will say, I need more of this, so it creates a craving. Plus, they'll put high doses of caffeine there, which give you a sugar rush anyway, whether you're taking sugar or not. So you're in a between a rock and a hard place. You're not gaining anything. All right. Now, gamma aminobutyric acid is a neurotransmitter naturally produced in the brain and nervous system as well as in the heart, and it plays an important role in mood and stress management, and it influences a person's sense of well-being. Caffeine has been found to interfere with the binding of gamma aminobutyric acid receptors preventing it from performing its calming function. You're not designed to be hyperactive. You're designed to be calm and collected, like me, for example. <laughs> Don't believe it. The fact of the matter is, we're not designed to be constantly on a high. Now, here's an interesting uh, little study that was done. It's, it's uh, just a general news broadcast, but it's interesting. They don't want to run coffee down, so they'll tell you, it's okay, you can have it, etc. But they want to tell you the bad as well, so let's just listen to it. You likely know we've reported often here on World News about the powerful effects of coffee and the growing body of research telling us in the right amounts it can help us focus better and even fend off some disease later in life. But we ask tonight, what is it really doing to our brains? ABC's Lisa Stark with her own MRIs before and after. It's the most popular drug in the world. I need that little um, boost. 
it's everywhere. From 320 milligrams in a Starbucks Cafe Grande, about the max you should have in a day, to energy drinks, to sodas, now even inhalable, 100 milligrams in an instant. But could that daily dose of caffeine be changing your brain? We turned to researchers at Wake Forest in North Carolina, where I underwent two MRI brain scans. This first scan with no caffeine in my system. Then I downed just one drink. Now my second MRI. This was my brain before caffeine. This was after. The difference was remarkable. It's like a 40% drop in the blood flow to your brain. So that's a lot. So before caffeine, with caffeine, the blood flow to my brain dropped down about 40 percent. 40 percent. Really? Yes. Why the drop? Caffeine blocks a chemical called adenosine, which controls blood flow to the brain. Add caffeine, blood vessels constrict, less blood circulates in the brain, and your blood pressure and heart rate go up. So if you skip your regular coffee, that surging blood can trigger a caffeine headache. It's like trying to get a fire hose to pump blood up through your skull. If you're a caffeine lover, your brain has actually changed. It now functions normally on caffeine. How much caffeine do I have to drink to change the physiology of my no, brain? Not very much. Not very much? No. Like even a One cup, cup of day? One cup a day will change your brain. The good news, experts say for healthy adults, a few cups a day is not dangerous. But keep in mind, a little caffeine can do a lot. Lisa Stark, ABC News, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. That was really something Lisa... One cup, 40% reduction in brain blood flow. Uh, is that significant, you think? It's unbelievable. Let's have a look at theobromine. That's the substance in chocolate. Now, ladies, fasten your seatbelts. Uh, Cadbury milk chocolate, one ounce, has 44 milligrams of theobromine. That's not a very big slab. Chocolate syrup, just two tablespoons, 89 milligrams. Or the chocolate flavor mixes that you give to your kids in milk, uh, two to three heaped teaspoons, 120 milligrams of theobromine. That's significant. And remember, the younger you are, the slower you metabolize it and get rid of it through your kidneys. So it has a much longer effect. A small child will be three to four times more sensitive than an adult, just from getting rid of it. All right, is chocolate a food or is it a drug? Although addictive behavior is generally associated with drug and alcohol abuse or compulsive sexual activity, chocolate may evoke similar psychopharmacological behavioral reactions in susceptible persons. They always put it so carefully. A review of the literature on chocolate cravings indicates that the hedonic appeal of chocolate, notice, fat, sugar, texture, aroma, is likely to be a predominant factor in the cravings. Just the composition. Fat, sugar, texture. I had a colleague who was asked to investigate chocolate because they put it onto... Uh, Lifeboats as an energy food if you are stressed. Probably not the worst thing you can do, but he was to show how good it was. So he thought to himself, well, what am I going to do? Well, the best guinea pig in the world is a student. A student will do anything for money. So he advertised that he was going to do an experiment. He was going to put a uh, catheter into your, into your vein he was going to draw blood at regular intervals, and you would just get a short little meal. So the first group, he gave the components of chocolate. He thought, well, what's it consist of? It's milk, sugar, and theobromine. So the first group got a glass of milk, because one slab of chocolate will contain approximately a glass or two, a glass and a half of milk. So they took a glass of milk. The next group got a glass of sugar, the equivalent in a slab of chocolate. The next group got the combination, milk, sugar. The next group got the combination, milk, sugar, theobromine. Fascinating. The milk. He took the milk, monitored it, 
glucose stayed relatively normal, triglycerides, fat content in the blood went up, stabilized after two or three hours, back to normal. Okay, sugar, interesting. The sugar spike went up, fat also went up. Where did that fat come from? There was no fat in the drink. So it was released by the cells to cope with the glucose spike. So that was a bit of a problem, but it stabilized after a while and came down, even though they were hypoglycemic after that, which is not so good. Combination, milk, sugar. No theobromine, just milk, sugar. Major disaster. Up went the glucose. Up went the triglycerides, but they didn't come down. They stayed there for 10 hours and then came down. Now you understand why people drink milk, sweet combinations to go to sleep. A glass of milk with honey or one of those milk drinks. Because you go to sleep, why? Because you're cutting the oxygen to your brain. But at the same time, you're increasing the triglycerides, so your heart is now actually pumping a much more viscous fluid not a good idea. No wonder so many people die in their sleep. The third lot was a total disaster because all the spikes were increased dramatically and stayed there for a long period of time. All right, so a review of the literature says that just the fat-sugar combination is a problem already. The texture, of course, it's smooth, the aroma, it's likely to be predominant in craving. Chocolate may be used by some as a form of self-medication. Oh, well, that's not so important. Uh, and then compulsive behavior, because it affects your serotonin and dopamine levels. Chocolate cravings are often episodic, fluctuate with hormonal changes. Now, this is interesting. Just before and during menses, which suggests a hormonal link and confirms the assumed gender-specific nature of chocolate cravings. In actual fact, it's an aphrodisiac as well. No wonder the lads like to give a slab of chocolate to the ladies when they take them out. And depending on the hormonal cycle, it'll have a far greater effect in the female than in the male. So ladies, watch out. You could be being tricked into trouble. And then chocolate contains several biological active constituents, methylxanthines, biogenic anamides, cannabinoid-like fatty acids. So this is like, like cannabis, of all which potentially cause abnormal behavior. So here's a very complicated thing. It's too small to read. But just to give you an idea, the biogenic amines in chocolate, there's a whole list of them. I'm not going to even read them. Uh, then the, the alkaloids, caffeine. There's caffeine in, in cocoa. There's theobromine, which is worse than uh, caffeine. And uh, then it has something which is called salsolinol. And this component is the one that has the cannabinoid uh, activity, cannabis effect. Now, more than a century ago, this writer actually warned against milk and sugar. Far too much sugar is ordinarily used in food. Cakes, sweet puddings, pastries, jellies, jams are active causes of indigestion. Especially harmful are custards and puddings in which milk, eggs, and sugar are the chief ingredients. The free use of milk and sugar should be avoided. I wonder how this person more than a century ago would make a statement like that, which science is corroborating at this time. Uh, it also says that the combination milk and sugar clogs the system, irritates the digestive organs, and affects the brain. I found that rather fascinating. How does it affect the brain? Well, we've seen that the milk-sugar combination clogs the system because it increases the triglyceride levels and causes clumping, cuts the oxygen supply to your brain, and if you add the theobromine, you're doing the same as caffeine, cutting the supply to your brain by 41%. How are you going to think 
uh, what's right and wrong? Ladies, how are you going to think? The guy's giving you chocolate. Ooh. 41% reduction in brain activity. Salsa linol and chocolate addiction. Cocoa and chocolate contain the alkaloid salsa linol up to a concentration of 25 micrograms per gram. It is a dopaminogenic active compound that binds to various receptors. We don't have to go into all the details. And uh, it releases... Uh, Psych it, it inhibits the formation of cyclic EMP and the release of beta endorphins in the pituitary, so it, it totally destroys your hormonal balance in the brain. And taking detected concentrations of the substance, uh, well, it will lead to chocolate addiction. And it has a cannabinoid interference factor. Your brain actually produces these substances to stimulate or to repress where needed. When you take cannabis, dacha, then weed, whatever you want to call it, you're overstimulating these portions and then you can go into you know, all the things that happen with it. Now, chocolate will do exactly the same thing. It will also bind with those substances. So the receptors lock and key activity will take place. All right, now let's uh, briefly just talk about these substances. What do they do in these so-called smart drinks? They have such high levels of caffeine that they are in actual fact a number of court cases where particularly young girls uh, simply because of the fact that they probably are lighter and their metabolism is slightly different in terms of their hormonal buildup, where there have been numerous deaths as a consequence of caffeine overdoses and the effects of these, these substances. And I find it interesting that they all have such highly occult um, writings on them. It's almost as if there is an enemy out there who has planned for this generation to be so affected in their mind that they will not be able to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong. Now, I don't want to be a stick in the mud, but I've learned over the years that whenever there's something bad, there is a substitute that is good. So you don't have to suffer in this world. You can use a substitute. And uh, for chocolate, there's a substitute. You can use carob. Some people say they don't like the taste of carob. Well, start becoming innovative, mixing the carob, let's say, with hazelnut butter. Creates the same texture and taste as you would have in a a slab of Toblerone. You can achieve that. And there are companies now that are getting pretty good at making these things. Okay, it won't have the kick, it won't give you the high, but it will give you the texture and the taste without the negative effects. So there are things that you can do to prevent what industry has done. And I'm wondering if there is a plan behind all of this. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now if you happen to be a heavy coffee drinker, or even a mild coffee drinker, and you stop, then your blood vessels will start to react. Because caffeine causes the vasoconstriction which restricts the blood flow to your brain, the lack of caffeine will cause the vasodilation and you will start to have blood going to your brain where you didn't have the similar flow before and you are going to experience the mother of all headaches. It's just one of the, the ways in which the body is telling you 
there's something happening to my brain that hasn't been happening before. And you will be inclined to say, well, I can't handle this, I'm going back to my coffee. No, you have to push through. You have to be determined. You have to do something else. Go and take water with lemon juice. It's not going to solve your problem. It's just going to be a placebo. And you're going to get through it. It'll take a couple of days and you will have solved the problem. If you are addicted to any of these other things that we've spoken about, find an alternative. Do something. If you find you have a craving, give yourself an alternative activity. Then the brain patterns will change and you'll be able to adapt to it. So this is my message to you. We've been given a wonderful mind and God wants us to use it for the right purpose. I find it interesting. I used to be very involved in the occult world. And when the occultists want to have a communication experience with their spirit world, guess what? They become vegetarian and they avoid all forms of narcotics, whether it is alcohol or coffee or any one of those. Now, if that works in the spirit realm, how much more so can it work in the true spiritual realm where you are speaking to the true source of everything in this universe? So, uh, I hope I didn't spoil your evening. Thanks for listening.